human announcer. Access to this webinar is for educational and informational purposes only. Consult a licensed broker or registered investment advisor before placing any trades. All securities and orders discussed attract and monitored in virtual trading accounts. Virtual account prices and returns may differ from actual trading results. Commission costs are excluded. Neither Philstar World, Com, PSW, nor its affiliates, nor any of the respective offices, personnel, representatives, agents, or independent contractors are in such capacities licensed financial advisors, registered investment advisors, or registered broker dealers. Nothing contained in this webinar, website, or promotional material constitutes a promotion, recommendation, solicitation, or offer of any particular investment, security, or transaction. Trading options involves risk. Visit the OCC website www.optionsclearing.com to read characteristics and risks of standardized options. PSW provides education and training services that are meant to teach you the risks and potential rewards of trading options, and we are not a service that tells you what to trade. We are not implying or guaranteeing any profit. As always, do not trade with money that you cannot afford to lose. Past performance does not equal future results, and results discussed in this webinar are not typical and are only valid on that specific or identified date. Your results may vary. By accessing this webinar, you agree to hold the above harmless from any loss as you may incur as a result of information discussed in the media are identified above. By accessing this webinar, you agree to be placed on our mailing list and receive our newsletter. Rest assured, we take your privacy very seriously and we will not distribute or sell your information to anyone. All right, fantastic. I'm ready to go. How are you guys? We have a lovely day in the market. Hey, Bill Cosby got found guilty finally. So at last that's over with. Jeez, I couldn't believe he was not found guilty the first time. Um, let's see, charts. We have a nice looking market today, up about 1% across the board. We got 095, 092, 160, and 051. The Russell is the lagging guy right now, but certainly nothing to be shorting over. Um, oil faded down to 68. Uh, you know, weekend, it's, I, I, it's, I, I don't have a reason to go long, and, and unfortunately, if gasoline were lower, I wouldn't mind going long on gasoline for the weekend, but it's already at 210, so that's no fun. Natural gas had a really nice pop. Um, you know, we, we're we're long term long on natural gas. <clears throat> Short term, I, I think that might be a little toppy for it. Seventy at seventy five at eight. At, I'm sorry, eight eight point seven five. But we'll see what happens there. I don't. Again, not these are not good bets. I don't see anything really good lining up. Sixty seven hundred. We know is shortable on the uh, Nasdaq. That's where we started last um, the other day. And we caught a nice run down to 6,500. There's a 200 point drop. So it's taken two days to make up the 200 point drop that we had on Tuesday. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, has everybody else made up their drop? No, the Dow's still below and the uh, S&P is still below. So, and, and well, I mean, you know, the NASDAQ's still below two by 40 points. That's not nothing. And the Russell is way below. So I suppose if I had to say something, they probably won't be today, but Let's say that the NASDAQ crosses back above 6,700 and the Russell is still slow. Then the Russell makes a good long to catch up. But as it is, I will see the, you know, it's all about the earnings tonight. You've got uh, Google and Microsoft mostly. I'm not Google, sorry. Um, oh, is it? That can't be Google. Who was it? I don't know. When you need to know these things, you got to read Phil Stock World. Let's see. <laughs> I wrote it this morning. I forgot now. There's somebody big and Amazon. It's Amazon and Microsoft. Um, so we have Amazon, Microsoft, Intel, Starbucks, and Baidu. So Amazon competes with Baidu. Microsoft competes with Amazon on the cloud stuff. Uh, Intel does their own thing. Uh, and Starbucks does their own thing, of course. So we'll see what happens there. And then tomorrow morning, we get Exxon and Chevron. Now, uh, Valero had really good refining mar really good refining margins today. So here's an easy way to bet something. If Valero, who's a refiner and a, and a, a fairly pure refiner, so Valero had really nice earnings today, it popped them two percent, even though they're like super high in the first place. Um, had really good earnings, and Exxon. 
is trading middle of their channel and Chevron is trading middle of their channel, even though Exxon's a bit lower, they're more middle than the Chevron. So now we have to say, well, let's think about this. So good refining margins. Now Exxon, of course, has plenty of refining operations. So does Chevron. The integrated oil guys are very mixed. So we know that part of their operation is good. Uh, another big part of Exxon is specialty chemicals. Oh, wait, I bet I can show you this stuff. Um, trade. For big companies, Think or Swim has profiles. Here you go. And you can see what the company's made of. There you go. Look. So Exxon is 44% pure crude oil and natural gas. Um, 18, 19% gas and power marketing. 13% natural gas. There's natural gas liquid. This basically this is all natural gas. They really lump that in with natural gas, like 60% almost. Put refined petroleum, 12%, and chemicals, 10%. So we don't really care what chemicals do, but the point of chemicals and refined is because if oil and gas are cheap, these guys make more money. They have but because they're that's their input cost is, is oil and natural gas. That's why they do this because uh, if their rest of their business is doing crappy, the refining and chemical business bring it up. Now. In this particular case, refining is doing well. Chemicals are probably doing okay. You got to look at like Dow or Alco or somebody like that. Uh, not Alco, it's like Dow, Dow or DuPont or somebody like that to see who's doing in chemicals. Um, so now it comes down to if you want to know if Exxon's going to do well, how are natural gas and oil prices since last year and since last quarter? So now that we now that we know what we're looking for as far as to, to round out their earnings, we go to um, here. And we look at the um, let's look at the weekly views. So last quarter, actually no, we we'll do daily because it's kind of confusing. All right, last quarter, we'll do the quarters first. Last quarter, uh, and you assume it was three months ago. So three months ago, this January, they had a poor report. I'm not sorry, not a poor report. Oil was in good shape last quarter. It went bad after that. But until that time, it was doing well. Now, that's interesting because now we want to get more granularity on Exxon. And I want to see when did they go down? Did they go down after oil went down? So, yeah, they were fine. Okay, they had earnings somewhere around here in January. They were fine, but then oil went down and they plunged. Okay, so oil has recovered in higher than it was last quarter, but Exxon has not. Even going backward, if you look at the average price of oil for this uh, for the for the uh, first quarter for January, February, March, uh, it was definitely high. January, February, March was definitely higher than December, November, October. The average price of oil. So that means that we can be almost certain that Exxon's oil sales will be better because not only they sell more or less oil, you know, they're going to sell the same amount of oil each quarter. It's really a question of how much money they get for the oil. There's very few variable costs for them other than that they're going to produce you know however many they'll produce 20 million barrels a day globally and it's nothing's going to change that like you know nothing normal is going to change that so it's not about how many barrels they sold or anything like that there's no major variable there it's really just about the price and the average price of oil was about here at 62.50 and in the fourth quarter the average price of oil was 55 so you're talking about a pretty significant bump in the price of oil so now we look at uh, gasoline. Well, gasoline, we already know the refining. It doesn't matter what the price of gasoline is, although gasoline went up too. It's about the refining margin, what they call the crack spread. The difference between the price you're selling gas for at the pump and what you're selling it for and what you're getting it for at the, um, what you're paying for it in the oil. In this case, Exxon pays themselves for the oil, but that doesn't matter. They have a, a profit on the oil sector, but then it depends on where, how much they sell it for at the pump, whether they have additional profits. And as we all know, gas prices have gone insane, so they're getting good margins. Now, last factor then would be natural gas. Natural gas, not as good. It's a little bit lower than they were here in this part. They, you know, they, were, they were up around $3 in the fourth quarter, October, November, December. Had a dip there, so let's say 3 plus 3 plus, um, plus 280. Ah, it's not much of a difference. So it's like 285, 290, whatever. So somewhere they're, they're around 285. Now here, we started off good. 
So you've got a, a three, uh, let's call it 320, but then 280 brings it back to the three average. It's actually the same. So it averages out about the same. And all I'm doing here is just I'm calling this 320 for the month as an average. I'm calling this um, February probably is 280 or less for the month average. And so that's so a three, 320 plus 280 averages at back to three. And now if I add 280, that's the same thing I did over here when I was adding it up. It was three plus 280. So three plus three plus 280 is the same as 320 plus 280 plus, plus 280. So um, bottom line is though, there shouldn't be anything bad about Exxon's report. So now moving on, let's take a look at what the expectations are for Exxon's report. Uh, and, and of course, I'm, you know, obviously you want to look at, are there any other factors that affected anything? Did anything happen? Blah, blah, blah. I don't think anything actually happened, though. I don't remember any major news or anything that affected Exxon over the last quarter. So what are the expectations? Analysis. Okay. <clears throat> so expectations are last year they earned 359. This year they're only projected to earn four. They're, well, not only. They're projected to earn 477. That's a big jump. So, they, so expectations are for them to do much better than last year. That's one process. So not as easy as we think to call this a positive. They are expected to do a uh, dollar thirteen versus ninety five last year, and last quarter was uh, freaking notes. Um, last quarter was eighty eight cents. So we we see that they're probably going to do better than last quarter, but they're expected to do better. That's the problem. So. It all seems good and everything's fine, but the problem is they're already expected to do at least 10%, more than 10% better than they did last quarter. And I don't think they're going to miss, but I don't, I don't think they're going to really blow away the expectations either. I think they, they had a nice quarter, and then it's all going to come down to the big item is going to be well, how much they're actually going to end up spending on taxes. And I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of this growth is based on the expectation that they're going to have lower tax rates also. But to get to 477, they can't only do a uh, dollar 13 a quarter. They have to do a little bit better than that. So we'll see. But anyway, so that's how you, that's how if you when you have a company and you understand the moving parts, that's how you can kind of figure out if they're going to have good earnings or bad earnings. So we have certainly no reason though. There's no reason to think they're going to fail their 200 day moving average. So then you can look. Let me see. Wait, hang on. We'll do a question first before you look at the trade. Uh, you wanted to be reminded of MO, did I? Why would I want to be reminded of MO? Now you have to remind me why I wanted to be reminded of MO. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. So I don't know why we wanted to be reminded of MO. We made a play on them, I think. I like them. Um... I lost track of what I was doing. Ah, play on Exxon, right. So since they're since they're just barely over the 200-day moving average, and since we certainly think earnings are going to be better than last quarter, and since last quarter when they announced their earnings, they actually went up until oil fell. So it wasn't, it wasn't because of anything they did. It's just because oil fell and everybody started selling the sector off. So – probably they're going to hold their 200-day moving average. So they'll stay over 80, most likely. So let me look to see, is there a reasonable play you can make on Exxon for 80? Um, well, you can sell the, these short-term puts. These May puts can be sold for a buck 80. That's a lot of money. You know, when you've got an, it's an $80, it's an $80 stock, and you're collecting $1.80 against it for, um, you know, for, let, you know for, two, for three weeks. You know, it's because earnings are, of course, inflating it. But, of course, you don't have much cushion there if you're wrong. So I'm not so thrilled with that. So look a little bit longer in months. By the time you get to July, they're into the next earnings already. But that might not be so bad because, you know, we should have a good, good summer quarter, too. So now we could look at either selling the uh, $80 puts over here for $275 or $280, sorry. So $280 for the $80 puts in July. So if we sell them, what do we got? We had we get we collect the money obviously at 275. The margin, let's take a look what the margin requirement is for that. Sell single puts and 10, for example, is my normal default. We'd sell them for 280. 
and it's going to be it's going to hit me for nine thousand dollars you can see a nine thousand dollar charge against it so it's not a margin efficient way to trade it but you can make twenty eight hundred bucks so we're going to collect twenty eight hundred dollars it's going to hold nine thousand dollars in margin this is an ordinary margin account um and uh and basically the cushion is of course about five percent because if exxon drops four bucks we're we're just about break even on the play so we're not so in other words we, we're good for a five percent drop and then more than five percent begins to hurt us but it doesn't really the thing i like about it though is it doesn't really hurt you because what are we selling for 280 if you go out further in time the 65 dollar puts of 2020 or 280. so so it doesn't work out perfectly but let's say exxon drops 10 percent and it goes to 72 bucks the only bad thing is I would have to keep the margin would stay affecting me. So I'd be down $9,000 in margin in my, in my account, but I could easily roll to these guys. The 75s in January are $3 and the 60 um, and the 65s in the next year, are $3. So I can roll out all the way down to 65, 60, $70 or $65. So I can withstand in reality, as long as I'm not worried about that margin getting tied up, I can withstand in reality a pretty big hit, like a 20% drop in Exxon, and I can still do okay on the 2020 puts. So my worst case is making about 30% back on margin if it goes wrong and I have to hold it for two years. So 30% in two years against margin is not fantastic. If you have portfolio margin, it wouldn't matter. But if, but if you have ordinary margin, it's not fantastic. But my better case, of course, is making the same 30, is making uh, 30, no, was it 270? <laughs> what do we say we're selling? The 80s? No, it's, it's 180. So for 180, sorry, so for 180, we sell the 80. So we're about to get $2,000 back against 9,000 in 21 days. That's fantastic money, of course. You know, you make 2000 or 9000 a month, you're going to have a very good year. Um, so that's, it's an interesting way to trade it. It's not exciting. It's not really something that we generally do at, at Phil Stock World because it's a, it's just a quickie earnings play. But it is a way to play Exxon on earnings. And next week, if you guys remind me, I'm not, I'm not actually going to execute that play. But if you remind me next week, we'll take a look and see how it panned out. But that's a way that you can pick up some very quick, nice money on earnings if you like to play that way. Now, of course, the downside is you won't X on cheaply, especially if it's a stock you want to own cheaply. So, you know, you always want to look ahead, see who's got earnings, think about who might be easy to call. And the reason I thought Exxon would be easy to call is because there's not that many moving parts to them. And we can analyze them quickly and figure out if they're going to make money or not. Chipotle, who the hell knew they were going to go up 20%? You know, you, there's a lot of working pieces in Chipotle. Exxon doesn't have that much to worry about. Uh, let's see. Uh, Philip Morris had results today or, or Altria. Two days ago in chat, someone asked about at the end of the day, and you sent a note to remind you about it today. Did I? Wow. I have no idea why. Okay, well, let's do they have, have they had earnings or they're having earnings? Let's find out. Okay, I'll do, I can do that. You don't have to figure that out. All right, so we're going to look at Mo. Now, Philip Morris, the international part of Altria, you know, they, that's what the difference is. Philip Morris PM, they sell all the same stuff, but they do it in foreign countries. Uh, Altria does stuff in America. So apparently they had earnings, I imagine, because they're down a lot. Um, <laughs> no, they didn't have earnings and they're down this much. That's crazy. Earnings, July 27th. No, they had earnings because they, they changed the earning date. They had it today. Clifton, New Jersey, this tiny company. I live right next to them. Hmm. Okay. Um, why am I reading this many articles? If they had earnings today, how come there's no mention of it on this, all this whole news feed? Gas pro why oh this is Exxon's news. This isn't their news. Isn't that weird? Let's try that again. There it is. <laughs> uh, 
All right, so two hours ago, what do they say? Is it time to buy an Altria? See, I don't want to tell you this. Somebody else wrote it. Um, significant price past couple of months. My blah, 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 blah. Question, blah, blah, blah. Are they cheap? What are the growth expectations? Their actual growth is better than, than the estimated growth has been, so they're on a good path, obviously. Uh, da, 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 da. This is a useless article. Holy cow. Really? Who writes this crap? This is Yahoo. All right. So, oh, simply Wall Street. I'm oh, sorry, guy, but that's zero information was conveyed in that article. Um, how about this one? <laughs> Who do we have to thank for that? This is Zach's. Okay, Zach should hopefully have something. Um, continued strength in the bottom line. Uh, adjusted earnings, 95 cents. That's what we want. 95 cents a share. Estimates were 93. Uh, we don't care what they were last year. Um, net revenues are up a teeny tiny bit. Now, I understand they're in a transitional thing because they're moving people to smokeless off of the other cigarettes, so there's a whole weird sort of dynamic there, and you can't expect them to have a lot of growth right now. Um, it looks like beats and beats and beats. I don't see what the problem is. The end of the quarter cash, $2.2 billion, $13 billion in debt. Um, dividends, they're likely to hike the dividend. Um, da, da, da. During the quarter, they paid dividends, consolidated manufacturing outlook. Management's reiterated earnings to a little bit of a range of four bucks a share, up from up from 20% over a year. <laughs> Excludes a charge of seven cents for tax adjustments. Further, the company expects full year 218 effective tax rate. Okay. Um, I don't see what the problem is. I mean, this is a weird reaction because it's they're going to earn four bucks a share, and you can buy them for uh, fifty bucks, right? Fifty-four bucks. So the PE on that is um, like fourteen. I don't and 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 here they're saying ten, but they're looking. This is a forward PE when they do that. <clears throat> Analysts say. Analysts say four bucks a share, four bucks next year. I don't get it. I'm sorry. So is there an actual question on now? I, I, we can put a play up if you want. That's easy enough. See, I like Altria because I think there's going to be a tipping point at which pot gets legalized, and these guys are going to start selling pot cigarettes, and the margin on pot cigarettes is going to be astronomical. And... Let, let's quickly think about the dynamic. I think we talked about this last week, didn't we? Um, but, the, you know, think about the market dynamic. Any idiot can grow pot. Okay. So what does Philip Mars have to offer? Well, first of all, any idiot can grow pot, but it's quasi-difficult, legal, whatever. But Philip Mars can certainly grow pot. They can grow in whatever state it's legal to grow pot in. Um, and, of course, obviously, they can deal with all the banking, all the money stuff that's a problem for the pot growers. doesn't have any effect on Philip Morris. They have a million ways to deal with the money. They're a huge company. Um, they, can, they can create something the pot growers can't do. Pot growers sell you pot in a jar, and they put it in a bag, and you take it home, and you deal with it yourself. Philip Morris can sell you a pack of joints. And they can and they can have quality control, quantity control. You'll know exactly what you're getting every single time. It's going to be a whole different ball game for them. And they can do it, and they can sell you a pack of joints for twenty bucks or fifty bucks, let's say. But you know, instead of uh, which I I don't know how much a pack of joints weighs, but uh, you know, twenty cigarettes must be like a uh, I'm going to say at least a quarter ounce, probably a half ounce. So. Um, I want to be talking about a half ounce. Um, hang on. I'm actually, right now, I'm putting my fingers together thinking of what a dime bag used to look like. So I know what a dime bag looked like. That was a quarter ounce. And I have to think that 20 cigarettes would be a half ounce. Yeah, that's my guess. Anybody who knows anything better than that can tell me. Um, so anyway, so... Instead of charging $150 for a half ounce of pot like these stores are doing, these guys, Philip Mars can easily, because it costs them nothing to grow. They already have everything they need to grow pot. They can just, instead of growing tobacco, can grow pot. Um, 
and they could sell it obviously for more than cigarettes therefore more profit end of story it's not complicated so you don't think they're not going to do it they're going to do it <laughs> if it's legal to sell pot they'll sell pot so the vaping thing going well for them it's uh doing okay smoking is dropping off vaping is picking up and it bounces out um but the real growth story or the or the or, the, or, or in other words nothing's changing for them they're still going to make the same four dollars a share they always make but there's a potential that nobody's pricing into this stock that they can make five six bucks a share if things go well on the pot side not why you want to buy it you want to buy it conservatively but we'll buy it for that reason so i definitely like them um okay newbie question we'll get to later in pg hopefully smoke and dip uh okay so outside question so let's finish this one off first so i can get to it so in the long-term portfolio uh hang on wow 16 look at that it really popped up with the market that's freaking impressive because we we were, we had taken a loss when we did the review we last week we had a, we we were down but now we're like blowing up. Holy cow! See that's it's so crazy though. It's four, we were at five forty right, so we just made, we made forty two thousand dollars this week. Oh shit! This Greg telling me to be on the webinar. Hello. Oh, uh, you forgot to remind me about the webinar. I'm doing it now. Yeah. <laughs> All right, later. Bye. <laughs> yeah, you can't vary. You can't have me vary my schedule like that and expect me to remember. So where were we? Um, uh, what were we told about? Philip Morris, right? I was going to finish. Ah, because I didn't know what trade we had in Philip Morris. That's right. So I don't think we only have these puts. I don't remember if we initiated a, a bigger trade. Hang on, you'll find that. Um, when did we review the options opportunity portfolio? Is that on Friday? I mean, the, the long term portfolio. I think it was Friday, right? Wow, it was a week ago already. Whoa, this week flew by. Holy cow. Okay, yeah. Oh no, it wasn't that bad. It was down with 575. So we were at 575 and now we're at I thought it was 540 something. Wait. What did I write it up? I did write something. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, it was four that's why I got mixed up. Had we had there was forty five thousand change. Um so five seventy five and now we're at a week later, five eighty two. That's not a big deal. Still, just seems like a bigger number to me. I don't know. All right, so we're at 582. It's very healthy, though. Now, the question is, though, did we change on MO? What do we do? Uh oh. Oh, I think I blew off that whole section. Short puts, we're just bookmarking them. Okay, so we did not make a change in the Philip Morris trade. We will now because it's just stupidly cheap and the earnings were fine. So there's no reason not to add to this trade. So for Philip Morris, at 50, just under 55 bucks, uh, we're gonna add a bull call spread, but first of all, let's see what we have. So um, actually here, end of that. Okay. So in the webinar, uh, we have, this is kind of what I do when I'm setting up a trade, except that I have multiple screens, so I don't have to go back and forth like this. We have five short, five 20, 20, 65 puts. We sold for 10 bucks. Wow. Well, I like that. <laughs> We're not changing those. We have five twenty. We have five M O twenty twenty dollar sixty five puts. We sold for 
ten dollars now twelve fifty. Those are fine. We in the webinar for the LTP. We are going to add, and here's the process. So now I'm going to say, what are we going to add? Well, we're at the stock itself, even though the stock's at 55 or whatever the heck it is. Um, so even though the stock is $10 below our 65, we sold the 65 puts for $10. So all they can do is make us buy it at the current price. I don't have a problem with that. What we're going to do, though, is... Um, we have no reason to change that. We have these 65 puts. Oh, actually, I'm sorry. They're, they're, they're now 14 bucks. I thought they were $12.50. $14. Those are fine. Because, you know, the $14 is a lot of its premium because we're at 55. And since we really do want to own the stock at the net price at 55 bucks, we don't have a problem with, you know, it doesn't matter to us that these puts are currently showing a loss. But what do we want to do is we want to add now the stock if we can. And we're going to take advantage as much as we can of this drop because look how cheap these things got. We can buy the calls. Um, so 55 is where we're at. Those are five something. So one thing I look at, how much does it cost to go to the next level? So here we got 540. I'm just going in the middle of each one to five to 660. So that's a buck 20. That's a no brainer. We're going to pay a buck 20 to go 220 lower. Um, now we go from 660 to eight, and that's a uh, buck 40 to go 250 lower. I'm willing to pay that. And now we go from eight to 980, 970. Um, that's a buck seventy. Now we're getting to the point where I don't think it's necessary. I don't need to spend a buck seventy to make two fifty. You know, it's getting a bit much. So now, so we've settled on this. So we're going to sell these puts for seven ninety five. I'm sorry, we're going to buy the calls for seven ninety five. So that's a fifty dollar call. So let's write that in. We're going to buy. We're going to add. We're going to buy. I want to be concise in my language. We're going to buy ten twenty twenty dollar fifty dollar yeah fifty dollar. Fifty dollar <laughs> calls. Not my usual keyboard. I don't look when I'm typing, so it's like um, if I get off a key, it screws me up. Uh, Fifty dollar calls for seven point ninety five. We are going to sell. All right. So I still think sixty five plus is a fair target. So we're certainly going to be at least in the sixty five. Um, oh, no, but we sold the 50s. So 50, 60, you know, to some extent, I'd like to get some money back on it. But now, now it goes the other way. So now I say, well, look, if I sell the $60 calls, that's $390. Then for $0.80 cents more, I can make, have $250 more headroom, and I believe in that target. I think $60, 250 is a very fair target. So that's I mean, it would be silly not to do that. And then for... Another dollar, I can go up another 250 to 65, which is where I think we're going to settle at least. So let's do that. So we're going to, so it's going to be an expensive spread. It's going to be three, yeah, 66, 65, 250. It's going to be 250. So we're going to sell 10 of the 2020 $65 calls for 250. And that's going to be 2500 And that's going to be 7950 Okay. And. Okay. That will net us into the spread four let's see we got a five thousand dollar credit there so it's 29.50 for 450 dollars so all we spent is 450 total dollars that one has to spread 450 dollars using the original put price it's a 15.50 credit if you do it from 
scratch because you'll collect 2,000 more from the um, short puts. Uh, but I don't know if you can do this for 450. Mm. And when Mo recovers a bit, we'll sell a few short calls. I'm also thrilled to roll the short puts to 2x something lower and roll down and double down on the spread if it goes if ammo drops below 50 but i super doubt it there you go okay so <clears throat> that's how we make a play so we looked at the play, we decided it was cheap enough to get to to add to it, and now we're gonna make the trade like this. And bum bum bum. Oops, missed the I. I? Nope, that didn't work. I N. Nope. <laughs> there. Okay. Um Oh, yeah, profit potential, right? So you want to talk about um, uh, upside potential is a very nice 15, not 15, 1450, 14,000. Four hundred five fifty. There you go. Fourteen thousand five hundred fifty dollars. Because it's fifteen dollars spread times ten would be fifteen thousand dollars. Now, notice the nice thing about the spread, though, is even though now again, even though we got a terrible price for the puts, it's still only netting us in for four fifty. That's from our original thing. Right now, if you did, it's fifteen fifty credit. So it's an insane return on investment. I don't know what that is, but it's like, it's a, you know, many, many times what you're putting in for cash. Um, and this one uses almost, this one uses very little margin. It's a wonderful play. So, you know, we, we took the puts that we sold and the, the point of selling the puts is to keep our eye on something. So we say, oh, look how, look how much we lost on those puts. Maybe it's time to buy the stock. <laughs> Cause it didn't change. The fundamentals of the stock haven't changed. It's just, there's been a huge overreaction to them. So um, we turn. So now we turn into a trade, but it's still it's a very small trade. We're only using four hundred and fifty dollars of cash. Our worst case scenario is we own thirty whatever thirty two thousand five hundred dollars worth of uh, Philip Morris stock at sixty five. So let's say they go to forty, and we lose twenty five bucks times five. That's only twelve. I mean, only it's twelve thousand five hundred dollars. It's not going to kill us if Philip Morris goes to to uh, 20 and that's our worst case scenario. So our worst case scenario is we're risking 10,500 up 10,250. Our potential upside is $15,000. Our potential upside is way, way, way more likely than our potential downside. And not only that though, but we're starting out $5,000 in the money. At 55 bucks, this trade is $5,000 in the money. And we only paying 450 for it now. No, I'm sorry, not now. We paid we paid four fifty for it. If you bought it now, you'd have a fifteen fifty credit and your five thousand dollars in the money. I don't know what else could I say. How good could a trade be? <laughs> I mean, they just they just give you money. It's just insane. All right. So anyway, so copy that and I always do it. I always I always highlight that you control A and control C because sometimes when you hit submit. It loot very rarely, but it, for me, it's especially annoying because my comments are like usually hugely long. Oops, and I forgot to indent it. Damn it. There we go. Now it's official. All right, so back to questions. And that's how we do a trade. Now, three says, can I take a look at P and G? So what, what has Procter & Gamble been doing for us lately? Um, 
they're just down with the whole sector. You can see Staples got beat up. It's not very exciting. What's going on with these people? Um, yeah, who finance is getting weird. Like a lot of stuff doesn't work right. Look at this. It's a little upsetting, right? This this is not good. Um, statistics. I don't know this is deep. I, I don't know. I'm gonna start using a different thing for default because these guys suck. Anyway, um, well, I'm sorry, Sky. Look, it doesn't even go to the bottom. Urgh. All right, net income, fifteen bill, fifteen billion dollars. <laughs> That's a lot of money. <laughs> oh my God, for freaking selling cereal. That's crazy. Um. Let me just see if I can get the numbers from my other thing. All right. Uh, that was an aberration. The $15 billion was unusual. I'm not sure why because I can't really look at the whole thing right now. But that's the, I wouldn't count that as normal. In 2016, they had $65 billion. They made $10 billion. In 2014, 75 billion, they made 11 billion. So, so that's more in line. The, the, the 15 billion doesn't make any sense. Realistically, they're making about 10 billion, 11 billion dollars a year. There's certainly not a lot of growth. It's a very boring company, but they're steady. Um, the market cap at uh, 73 bucks is 180 billion. So, at this price, you're paying roughly. 15, 16 times earnings. Um, it's not thrilling for this kind of company. They should be trading at 15 times earnings. So they're not particularly cheap. But they're nice and steady, and they do pay a dividend of some sort, which I don't know if I have that in my other thing. No, my other thing doesn't tell me what the dividend is. Um, I, I imagine it's like 3% or so. Um, let's see. Bum, bum, bum. Sales growth. Uh, I got the liquidity ratios. I have other things. Like, da, da, da. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nope, nothing on the dividend. Anyway, that's weird. All right, so meanwhile, it's a perfectly good blue chip company, but it's not it's not super cheap. They might have been super expensive when they came down a bit. Uh, PG. Yeah, that's what it is. They were they were just trading at a ridiculously high price. Now they're trading at a normal price. And and by the way, as we see more and more Dow components turning to normal prices, we begin to put a bit of a floor on the Dow. You know, because this is an acceptable price for Procter & Gamble, and a lot of Dow, and Exxon, we just said Exxon, we're at an acceptable price for Exxon. You can't call the Dow overboard if the individual components are not overboard. So we have to start really thinking about that, and I'll have to do a thing on that next week, I guess, or over the weekend. Over the weekend. Huh? No, I don't think so. <laughs> so I'll try to do next week, I'll try to do a study on the Dow at least, to say, are these things overboard or not? Because most of the Dow components are reported by now, I think. Um, and we just want to look at them and say, are these fair prices? Now, if the Dow is fairly priced, you can start pretty much extrapolating the S&P will be fairly priced. If the S&P is fairly priced, we have to start really ratcheting up our uh, expectations because that makes this a bit more of a floor. And the only reason we go lower is if things turn worse in the economy or in the globals or whatever. You know, So we have to take a look. But, but realistically, as far as the, the market goes, how can I short the Dow if I think all the components of the Dow are fairly priced? So we're going to have to go through those one by one and decide what we really think the Dow is worth. All right. But um, anyway, so P&G fairly priced at this price. The, the thing you can take advantage of, though, is that I would say 65 is where I'd start saying, "Ooh, I really want to get them at 65. Um, the thing is that having had such a big drop, it probably jacked up the price of the puts on the long term. So if we get down there and we look at what the uh, the price of like the $70 puts are, 
they're five bucks. So you could sell, even though we're at 73, you can sell the 70 puts for five bucks. You can sell uh, you can sell 65 puts for three. Ah, you know what? Because 65 is my target price. I think I wouldn't be greedy. I think I would just sell those puts. They're like 350, 355 um, for the uh, 2020 20, 65 puts. If you just sell those, it's same same as Philip Morris. Sell them, keep an eye on it. If they start going lower, then you get cheaper chance to get an entry. And if they start going higher, it's not going to really get away from you. Why doesn't it get away from you? Because the net delta of the trade. So let's say at 72, if it goes lower, you can get the 65. Um, let's say you got the 65, not even six, let's say 60, 75. The 60s are now 14 bucks. The 75s are five bucks. I'm just rounding off. So nine bucks for fifteen dollars spread. Now I'm not saying to do that. I'm just saying that's that's what that's the spread. If it goes lower, the delta difference between the two, the sixties are seventy eight delta. The fit the seventy fives are a forty four delta. So there's a twenty four uh, delta difference. So if in theory, in theory, if P and G, if PG drops five dollars, these things should move twenty five percent of five bucks to so a buck twenty five. So it'll go. So the price of the spread will go from like nine bucks to um, was it nine bucks? Fourteen, yeah. It'll go from nine bucks to like seven fifty. So now you can say, aha! So now I know what I want to pay for that spread. I want to pay seven fifty. Now what if? What if PG goes the other way? If PG goes the other way, well, first of all, you can easily raise your expectations. So you can go with the, um, if, in other words, if it never goes down and it starts going up, you can pick up the 70 or let's say even the 6750s, which are nine bucks, and you can sell the 80s. Now you're only getting 1250 spread, but then you can sell the 80s for 320. And what I say it was um, nine bucks minus 320 is 580. So it's substantially cheaper than the other spread. The other spread is nine bucks. So if it goes up, and now you, it's the same thing. You look at the delta difference between the 6750s, which are delta 62, and the 80s, which are delta 32. So the, the, the change there would be up a dollar fifty. So from 580 plus 150 is 630, 730. So the price of this spread will go up to 730. If P and G goes up five dollars, but then you'll be buying the spread when P and G is at seventy-seven dollars. You'll be buying the spread, the twelve fifty spread, for seven bucks plus less what you sold the puts for. Now, if it goes down five bucks, instead you would buy the fifty sixty-five spread or whatever I said, whatever I was sixty. I'm sorry, sixty seventy-five spread um, for for the same seven fifty. So either way, you're going to spend seven fifty on a spread. The question is, will it be the low spread or the high spread? So, and again, it's, it's in that funny situation where we initiate a trade and we hope it goes against us because at the moment, we're just going to sell the puts and see what happens. But then once it goes, it's actually better for us when it goes down like it did for, um, for Philip Morris, for, uh, uh, for Altria, I should call it. Uh, it's, so we, we actually like it when things go lower after we start these initial trades because we get a chance to establish bigger, better positions. But on the other hand, there's nothing wrong with... Uh, paying seven fifty for this spread and selling these puts for um, three fifty, so you're paying four dollars for a twelve dollar and fifty cent spread that's mostly in the money. There's nothing wrong with that. I mean, talk about two hundred percent returns on your money. So either way, we end up with very very nice trades that have very high probabilities of winning. Olga says, I'm still in the process of switching to thinkorswim. I can't hedge using a bull call spread on SQQ. I could, could I, could I buy, you could, <laughs> could I buy SQQ calls and offset them with more puts? You know, these brokers, they get you into this thing. It's a weird thing. They like they tell you to transfer your account, and they're going to transfer their positions. I don't know why they want to do that. It's To me, it's always easier to cash out and then just take the cash and move it to another broker and start from scratch. Um, 
Oh, the Dow's up 300. Uh, well, I didn't really want to. I didn't really want to do it intraday, but we'll take a look in a minute. Um, let's see. All right. So anyway, so you basically are worried about SQQ. If you buy SQQ calls and offset them with more puts, the dangerous thing is, of course, I don't know your account situation, but the dangerous thing is, you obviously, if it go, if the market does crash. And you're selling puts against stocks like Philip Morris or, or or PG and whatever. If you sell those puts, you still have to deal with the obligation those puts are going to put on you. Like here, we're talking about selling some 65 puts for 350. So we say sell single uh, 350, sell some 65 puts. So I've got a $4,700 obligation. So it is coming out of your account. This isn't free, free money. So you are using that up. And should the market go against you, the the um, the margin on the puts will increase. So not only will you show a loss. So let's say let's say it goes down enough that these things go to go to seven dollars. You'll show a loss of thirty five hundred dollars in your portfolio on the position, and the margin will go up as well. So all of a sudden, this thing that was requiring forty five hundred dollars of margin might require. Um, uh, nine thousand dollars worth of margin plus thirty five in cash, so that would be you know uh, seven thousand more in margin all of a sudden. So you have to be aware of that. Just if the market does crash, you and you sell too many puts, you're going to be really stuck dealing with those puts. So I, I'm not thrilled with that, and I don't like. Again, I don't like paying the interest in buying the SQQ calls. I don't understand. How you can't do a bull call spread, though. I find that just completely outrageous. It is covered. I mean, this is the insane thing about these stockbrokers. They 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 tell you that uh <laughs> they're like, okay, you're not qualified to have a spread, to have it to have a, a spread where you have a sensible position. Instead, you've got to uh, buy a lot of premium, and take idiotic risks. I don't see who they're protecting. The only they're not protecting anybody. It's disgusting. Anyway, all right. Next, uh, Ken says he has the 2019 57-50-70 spread with a 57-50 uh, short put. Um, I I'd, I'd, I'd roll it out. I mean, I I would certainly take advantage. Are we still in mo? No. <laughs> What I, you know, what I would do with that, Ken, is I would probably, um, you've got the 2019 57.50 calls. So, you you know, you're, you're screwed here, but of course, the, the nice thing is you do have premium left. You have 250, 260 in premium left. And if you spend the money to move out to the, um, let's say the 50 calls, which are eight bucks, you're going to spend 550. You're going to pick up 250 in position and a year of time. And then, and then what I would do is I wouldn't even change it though. I would let the I would let these guys expire, or if they don't expire, you can always roll them, right? Because look, these are two. Uh, these are fifty-seven fifty calls. The fifty-seven. Wait. Oh, I'm sorry. You have the seventies. The short seventies. Oh no, those aren't worth keeping. Oh no, forget what I said. Forget it. <laughs> I would I would just shut that tray. Then that's silly because the forty cents isn't worth anything. I would just go with the new, with the longer spread. The puts the puts are fine though. I mean, the target on the puts is fine. There's no pressing reason to change them. I wouldn't. You know, you're not getting paid enough. In other words, you're going to make six bucks if you hit your target at the end of the year. If you move to the 67.50s here, you'll get nine bucks. You'll make three more dollars for 12 more months. That doesn't make any sense. You only have eight months here, and you're going to make money. So you're going to make you're going to make you're going to make six bucks in eight months. It doesn't make any sense to make nine bucks in in, in um, 20 months. So you better, you know. So, so you are better off just sticking with those, and hopefully they hit. And if they don't hit, then you roll them. But they've still got plenty of premium in them. I mean, the, what did you say it was the fifty-seven, the fifty-seven fifty puts? They're at fifty-five, so two fifty is intrinsic. Four dollars of this is premium, and it expires in eight months. Fifty cents a month, you're going to pick up on the premium. Why would you want to move those? <clears throat> August said, you still play Ford at this price? Yes, I would. We talked about that this morning in chat. 
would you add Mo to the OOP? No, I would not because the OOP has actually used quite a bit of its margin and Mo is not a cheap stock, so I would not do that. I like Mo, it's a great play, but it's not, unfortunately, as the OOP is, it has plenty of stocks, so I don't want to. I don't want to add too much to it. Um, if you were talking about would I add it to a hundred thousand dollar portfolio set up like the OOP? Yes, I would if I had room for it. Um, the Dow is up three hundred, and we should look at the things Tom says. I'll look at that. Thoughts on LB? Absolutely love LB. I don't. I, again, this is just idiotic uh, a panic. We we haven't seen the earnings yet. I don't think. But um, it's, it's ridiculously oversold. I mean, just hopefully we have real numbers here we can talk about. <laughs> At 35 bucks, <clears throat> they're $10 billion market cap. And last year, let's see. Come on. They made a billion dollars last year. And, that was a bit, and last year was a bad year. So in a bad year, they've got a PE of 10. Okay, they, they just, uh, it's, it's, it's stupid. It is a stupidly cheap stock. Uh, I heartily recommend it. We have several plays on them. Um, I certainly, why does that keep coming up? I guess they know I'm in Clifton or near Clifton. I don't get it. Sponsored Everquote. Weird. Um, it's really creepy the way they, they like know who you are and where you are and all that. Let's see. Um, <laughs> they pay a six percent dividend at this price. Holy crap! I mean, that's 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 interesting. I didn't have to really consider that. I mean, at this point, you really buy the stock. If you bought the stock for thirty-five bucks. You bought it for thirty-five bucks, and you sold the conservatively sell the third. Well, you wouldn't have to wait thirty-five, thirty-seven, fifty. There's no, there's not enough difference between these not to sell the next one up. I would even sell the forty. So let's say you sold the forty. You buy it for thirty-five. You sell the forties for four thirty-five. That's going to bring your net down to uh, just about forty. I'm sorry, thirty-one dollars. Let's say or thirty-one fifty. Let's call it. And then if you sell. The $30 puts for five bucks. Wow. You would bring your net down to $26 and you're collecting a 240 dividend. That would make the dividend almost 10% back on the stock while you wait to get called away at third. At, at, I'm sorry, what are we still the 40s? Did we say we were going to sell? So if you're selling the 40s, so you get called away at 40 with a, a $10 gain there. It's crazy. That's the easiest play in the world. I mean, I, I can't even see a reason not to do that. So much so they got to call Doug and make sure we're in that in the hedge fund. I mean, that's just ridiculous. <laughs> They're just throwing money at people. LB earnings in May, right? Okay, thanks. Um, I think the flow on LB or the low. I imagine he means the low. Um, anyway, so yeah, I, it, it's it. Look, I don't care what the chart says. If I have ten billion dollars and I can buy a company that makes a billion dollars a year, a billion dollars a year, I want to own that company. It's hard to make a billion dollars a year. Even when you have $10 billion, it's hard to find nice ways to make a billion dollars a year. We're, we're living in a really weird, weird sort of time right now where the markets are returning incredible amounts and so on and so forth. But it's not normal. Normally, market, normally the best you're going to do is like 8% in the stock market. And the more money you have, the harder it is to hit those numbers. You know, that's why people are willing to pay hedge funds so much money. Because, you know, we, we can make them a lot more money than they can make trying to trade things themselves. Um, it's, you know, if you can steadily make a billion dollars a year in something that doesn't have a huge amount of competition. I don't know everybody worries about Amazon, things like that. 
But, you know, other than the fear of Amazon taking over every business on the planet, you know, and if you want to hedge against that, buy some Amazon stock. Not that I recommend it because it's ridiculously expensive. But other than fearing that Amazon will take over every single business and there's no point in investing in anything in retail because they're going to, you know, there's, they're all dead, which is stupid, obviously, then this is a great thing. The other great thing, by the way, in retail is SKT, is Tangier Factory Outlets. They're an upscale, mostly outdoor-y kind of mall, you know, like plaza kind of malls. Like, um, they do a lot of... Um, what do you call those things? Um, I would know if I went to them. Um, you know, where the off-price, the off-brand, uh, whatever they call it, there's a word for that. Um, you know, factory discount outlets. Discount outlets, that's it, factory outlets. Um, so they do a lot of the outlet type of places, but the high-end. And, and, and I, I know from going to them, because we have some around us, um, they are nice. They're great places. They have, they they design them well. They make it so there's plenty of places for people to sit. There's hangout spots. There's food things. They have events constantly. This is what I really like about them. They constantly have events for the towns, so, and they and they make it so the town. It's like a good gathering place for the town. So whenever like a school wants to have a thing or whenever they want to do rallies and stuff, they have it there. And they they have musicians in the winter. They do a big Christmas thing. They, they work hard to make their places happenings, and they've got people on waiting lists to be tenants. They have 90-something percent occupancy rates in their, in their malls, and they charge premium rents, but they attract premium outlets for that kind of stuff. And not just outlets, and, you know, regular stores too. And, and food, though. See, a lot of outlet places you go to have really crappy food. These guys have really good places for food also. Um, so... I really like these guys. I think they're a well-run operation. They have a really good system, and and the, their customers are, are you know people want to get into their things. That's the most important thing. You know they you know fine regular you know they're not a mall just because they're listed as a mall doesn't mean they run like a mall. This price and we talked about it this morning and they're already popping up again. This price is ridiculously cheap for these guys. So that's that's another retail. So uh, limited brands. SKT, both extremely strong buy recommendations on this thing. And SKT, we already have in the long-term portfolio, I think, I hope. No? Are you kidding me? Oh, there it is. <laughs> oh, 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 wow, we like it so much we bought the stock. We hardly ever buy the stock, so I was even looking there. Um, we have 2,000 shares of stock that we bought at 22.25, and it's right about that price now. What did we just say it is? 22.05, so we even paid more. So we bought the stock at 22.25. We sold the $20 calls, very conservative selling. So we sold calls that were lower than what we bought the stock for, for 4.05, and we sold the 22.50 puts higher, interestingly enough, than we bought the stock for 2.70. So our real target is to be at 22.50, but to make this a cheap play, because we collected, look how much we collected. We collected eight plus five, thirteen thousand five hundred dollars against forty four thousand five hundred dollars. So we got, we only spent um, thirty one thousand dollars on the stock, and we collect five thousand dollars in dividends while we wait to get called away at forty thousand dollars. So this isn't going to be a huge profit play. But what it's going to be is it's going to be just, it's a, I wanted to make an example, like here's a nice way that you can collect a dividend. Um, oh, it won't be 5,000, I'm sorry, it'll be 10,000. It's two years worth of dividends. Um, so we're gonna collect $10,000 in dividends, plus we're gonna collect another, oh, what did I just say, 31,000, 15, so we're at 15, and it's 20, so basically another 10. So we're gonna make a $20,000 profit on $31,500. So we're going to make a 66% profit. So we're going to make about 30% a year on this stupid little play that's dead conservative. And, and it's cheaper now. We were at a loss right now. So it is cheaper now than when we entered it. So, so all three thumbs up on this one. This is a really good one. And, and funnily enough, though, the only reason this is showing a loss is because the short puts have a lot of premium. Because we're only fifty, you know, they're only fifty cents in the money, and they're showing four oh five. That the the premium almost jumped up to an extreme level. 
which means obviously it's great to sell right now is to sell those books. All right, <clears throat> now we can take a look at the futures. Let's see. Oh, oh my God, look at this stuff go. No, see, we're still not over 6,700. I said if, if we get over 6,700, then you can expect the Russell to start moving up higher. As it stands, we're kind of drifting along here. It's kind of weird. Um, and now, I, I just, I mean, look, it's the end of the month. I would just kind of want to see how things turn out. I'm not, there's nothing particularly here that I think should be jumped on. Uh, oh, except for silver, hit 1650. That was a good chance to get back in on silver. I guess gold, actually, probably. Let's take a look on the other chart. Um, da, 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 metals. See, they both have the same kind of baseline, more or less, but silver's, silver is pretty reliable. Now, it could drop lower. It could drop to 1625, so you have to gut it out, and that's expensive on silver. I believe that would be um, $2,500 per contract if it fell. But um, the chance, but again, it's a risk reward. In other words, so if you got in here at 1650 on silver, the chance of it going to 17 is better than the chance of it going to 1625. But even if it goes to 1625, if you're willing to add to it on the way down, so let's say we start at 1650. And at 16.30, uh, so you, first of all, you have to completely ignore a 10 cent drop. If it drops 20 cents at 16.30, if you add one, you'll average 16.40. Then when it comes back to 16.40, you can get out. Now, if it keeps going down from 16 to 16.25, you might want to try to add at 16.25, but then you're going to want to be a little more careful about your stocks. So if you have two that average 16.40, and you add two more at 16.25, the average is going to be, uh, oh, man, why did I have to do math? 7.32. So you average, you'd average 16.32.50. And then if you got to move up with four contracts at 16.32.50 and you got to move back to 17, you'd be looking at like um, seven fifteen thousand dollars gain. So there's nothing to sneeze at. So what? And what's the risk if you have four at sixteen thirty two fifty? And let's say you stop at sixteen um, at sixteen um, twenty, you'd lose twelve fifty per contract. So you lose five thousand bucks. So basically, you're gonna you know in that kind of trade, if you're gonna trade it with conviction, you're risking five thousand dollars if silver spikes lower, and you stop out against the potential gain of like fifteen thousand bucks. So now, most likely you'll make something in between. I'm not saying you're going to definitely gain 15000 but the point is it's got a good risk-reward profile worth playing at that point. All right, and if we look at the hourly chart, we'll see how that's shaping up too. But you see, that's, it's, a, it's at sixteen fifty right now. Sixteen fifty is a good bottom. It's, it's spiked below. That's what I mean by ignoring. You have to learn to ignore these things. Of course, it spikes below. It doesn't mean the bottom's not holding. In the grand scheme of things, In the grand scheme of things, 1650 is a good bottom. That doesn't mean it never goes below 1650. You can't stop out at these arbitrary lines just because you have to look at what really happens. It really does dip back below. And you've got to give yourself a little bit of room before you start freaking out that you lost 10 cents. So you have to plan on losing that money. You have to say to yourself, okay, I'm not going to react here. If it gets to 1630, I'm going to add. And that'll be my average of 16.40 on the two. Then below 16.30 at 16.25, which is not very far below, I'll add one more time, hope 16.25 holds. But if that doesn't hold, I'll put a stop at 16.20 and be done with it. So I know right now going in how much money I could potentially lose. I have a co complete plan for what I'm going to do in the situation. Now, it's a situation that hasn't happened in all this time. It hasn't gone that low. And if I go back days, I don't know how clear it's going to be. It did happen in December. It happened in December. It happened in July. But it was successful in May. It was successful in 
June, in August. It was technically it was successful here in July. She waited until it got back up. It was uh, successful again here in December, and successful here, and successful here, and success. So in other words, like seven, seven times, eight times successful, and uh, two failures. So of course I'm going to play that. It's a good line. It's a good play. It's work, it works most of the time. doesn't mean it's going to work every time. You have to be very aware of that. If you play in the futures, you have to understand you can lose $5,000 as easily as you make $5,000. And, and if you can only play once and if, if $5,000 kills you, you shouldn't be playing the futures. End of story. It's like playing craps. It literally is like putting $5,000 on a craps table. Your odds of winning are only slightly better if you do a good job picking. The whole trick to it is to try to keep your risk reward ratios positive so that when you win, you win a lot more money than when you lose. And that's what you can't do in craps, because in craps, it's basically, you know, you, you can I'm, I'm not talking about long shots. I'm saying the point is if you're trying to be on an on an even bet in craps, you're gonna get paid an even amount of money. That's only that that won't help you because the odds are teeny tiny bit against you in craps. Even one percent against you. If you only get the same amount of money paid to you as you lose, and it's 1% against you, the more you play, the more you're going to lose. You're basically losing net 1% almost every time. Um, in this case, the odds are definitely in our favor because it, it's, you can see that it often hits 17. It rarely hits 16, 20. So that's the odds that we're going to play. Now, I could also yeah, I, I really like silver here. I think, and I think silver is poised for a much bigger breakout also. So it's definitely something we want to go for. In fact, I'll tell you what, let's add that officially. Trade active trader. And look at the dollar. Dollar. And they, oh, that's another thing. Look at the dollar is really strong. That's pushing down the metals too. So silver, it's not really 1550. It's 1557 now. Hmm. All right, I'll buy one. I just want to make it official. So there's one. We'll check back on that. Oh look, I already had it over there. I should have. I said I should have bought it already. So I'm at fifteen fifty seven. I've got one. I'll certainly buy another one. Uh, if we if we go to fifteen fifty three, not fifty three. Sorry, forty three. That will average me at fifteen fifty for two. Right, so that's my goal. My my goal is we go back to forty three, which is way down here, and I'll buy another one. So I want to be seven cents below um, 1650, and that will average me at 1650. All right, he's to ah, see the Dow's getting rejected. So let's go back to the indexes now, because maybe we'll get something interesting here. Because I think this is silly. I don't see any particular reason for this. I don't know if there's any news that you guys saw, but this is not a sensible rally. Uh, N Q R T Y. So who looks the most shortable? Well, it's still the NASDAQ. So I would say 1675 is a good stopping line for the NASDAQ. Um, you see this red line? That's that's where they're having problems. But it's just being a light rejection off of these lines doesn't mean anything. See how everybody hit the line at the same time and they're all getting rejected? That, that That's not necessarily bearish. That just means that they're getting a little bit of resistance where they should be getting resistance. But when you're up... You know, the Dow's up 1%, 244 points. Uh, the NASDAQ's up 1.75%, half a point on the Russell, 1% on the uh, S&P. Uh, a little pullback would be nice. And, and, and since this line is the top of the pivot range for, for three of the indexes, we should have something more than a teeny tiny pullback. So let's take a look at that one. We'll try that. Let's make a little short here. That's 6272.75 is the official line. And so what I want to watch now is I want to watch to see, as long as nobody else breaks over, I think we're in good shape for short. Oh, and the, and the NASDAQ just broke over. That's because you guys are shorting it. That's why. You're shorting it so the people who are, are trying to manipulate it are pushing it up. The other indexes are not following. So I'm going to take advantage of that because I'm dying. I want to add to my short. This is all your fault, you guys, because you're shorting. So I'll add another one there, which is where I want it to be. So now my average is 73.75.
and I, and you have to be aware of what your lines are. So my lines are three three thirty ish in the Dow, and two right around here, right two seventy three. So these are moving over. This might not be. This might not end up working. Now I'm at seventy three seventy five. So the next time I would want to add would be I would want it to get taken over seventy five. So uh, I need one point two five times two positions is two fifty higher than that number. So that's seventy four fifty seventy six fifty. So seven six five zero is where I'd want to do my next add. But now I have to think to myself, do I really want to add it at 76.50 or are the other guys clearly breaking over their lines? They're not. Only the NASDAQ is pushing over. And I happen to know why the NASDAQ is pushing over. It's because a whole bunch of jerks just jumped in and tried shorting it and they're trying to squeeze this out. So, I, so to me, it's up for bullshit reasons at the moment. At this exact moment, like nothing actually happened. That should cause that to happen, other than me telling, other than me saying I'm going short, and I'll bet people are following. Me. So, so I'm gonna, I'm willing to add at that level and to bring my, to bring my average up. But of course, when you're scaling in to bring up your average, it doesn't make any sense to do that unless you're scaling out too. Once you hit your levels, because I don't want to make a big, huge position out of this. I just thought it'd be fun to to see if we can get a ride down into the, uh, into the uh, close. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like I'm going to just, oh, oh, man, look how fast it fell. All right, so now I'm in a different situation. Now we have a profit, so I want to take off the one that I bought to raise my basis. But I want to see what's going on. I want to see if everybody's dropping. I'll give it a chance to go down a little bit. So now if anybody, now I want to, now I want to take one off. But if anybody ticks up, if he, if he even flinches higher, I want to get out like that. Oops. All right, now just wait. And now, or then now we get back to the other situation. But these guys are not going up. He's going up by himself, and that's probably because you guys are trying to buy. So I'm going to get, I'm going to stop, and I'm going to wait. Now we're back to my even spot. And what I say, 76.50, way up here is where I want to add one more. But, you know, if, if there weren't so many people playing, it would have been easy to do. But the problem is if I say something, then all you guys do it, it causes a problem. So and you do, you just have to learn to be patient. So as long as these guys are red, as long as he's red and he's red and he's red, why should I care what, what the NASDAQ is doing? So where did I want to sell? 7250, right? I wanted to get one, I wanted to buy one back. So we're either gonna, I'm either going to buy one back at sixty two at seventy two fifty or sell one at seventy six seventy five. One of the two. And if either, if any of these guys go green, I'm going to start losing faith in the trade. But so far, everybody's kind of red, and the Nasdaq's sort of pushing up. And I assume it's because you guys are messing around with it, so they're they're trying to flush us out before it goes down. You know, if you ever see that happen, it's, you see these spikes. You see these spikes that go the wrong way before it makes a move. Like here's a down spike before it starts making a bigger move up. Here's a down spike before it makes a big move up. They do that all the time. Here's a, here's an up spike before it starts selling off. Here's an up move before it starts selling off. They do that to flush. It's called flushing the stops. By doing that, they get rid of all the people who had orders in. Up oh, here we go. Oh, 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 oh. Ah, it's back at my spot. Ah, uh, you know, it's like fishing, you know, and like the fish is like right there and you're pushing and you've got the worm dangling on the hook and it's right in front of his face and he's not biting and gets pissed off. Oh, is it back? Wait. Oh, there we go. All right. Now, so what have I done? That's a $60 gain. Now I've raised my basis. So now my basis is up above 675. So now my stop can be 60. 
my stop can be 66.75 and I can't and I don't lose money. So I've now logged in a gain, raised my basis higher than my original target. And why was that? Because I added one, raised my basis, and then when I got into a profit, I sell the one that I added, and all of a sudden my basis is now nice and high. I don't have to worry about it. And now that, and now notice now that now that it's pushed, now that they've given up on getting rid of us, now down the NASDAQ goes. So that's a quick. 125, 130, 145. And I'm watching, I'm still watching the other indexes to see when to get out. Ooh, 666. <laughs> We're in 666 territory. Here's, here's all sixes down here. That's a good one to finish up at. So, 307, so I'm watching these numbers, 307, um, this one's six, so this one's 07, this one's 69, he's 67, 150, I don't want to go below like 120, so 120 I would stop out now, 165, I'm talking money, not the uh, 666, haha, see, I knew we'd hit that, 170, so still 669, 307. These guys aren't moving. So I'm going to take the money here. Whoops. All right. Made 160 bucks. Um, why? Because they weren't moving. The, he still, the, these guys stopped going down. He was kind of bouncy. I didn't want to, well, you know, I, I made a quick $160. So why risk it? Now, if you want to, if you want to go back in, now you say, well, okay, who's going to be the laggard? Well, if the Dow fails 24-3, that becomes a good stopping point. So we're not very far away on the Dow from taking a short at 24.3. Or I could use the 27.70 mark on the S&P. So, but meanwhile, since the S&P is below, I'll wait for the Dow to cross under and I'll use that for my, um, for my next entry. So that's all you do. You start looking now. Now that I've gotten out of that, I got my 160 off the table. I now look for the next place where I, the most, the most important thing in making an entry is to make sure that you have a good exit. And a good exit means a line that will, in theory, not cross so easily. Let's watch. Here's, six, here's 670. See how that got rejected at 670. Um, that's the point. If you, if you use that as your stopping line, it takes a bit for it to get over 670. It's not going to just flip right up usually. So it did get rejected at 70, but not strongly rejected. It's only 25 points below it. Um, and the Dow is still hovering up, and the NASDAQ is not going below, much below their 670 line. So there's no, there's no real indication of strength. It was easy before because everybody was failing at their red lines, and the question was how much will they pull back? So now he's 304. It's starting to get interesting again, 302. But these guys aren't making any real ground to the downside. So unfortunately, it's not really looking good for another short yet. Nope, it's going the, it's, now it's going the other way. Also, we're getting real close to the close, and sometimes we have these big rallies into the close. Up, oh, <clears throat> there goes 24.3. I'm almost thinking it might be smarter to play along on 24.3, but let's see what happens. 669, 668, these are good signs. So let's enter one more here. We'll go here, 296. So the point is, at 24.3, I know the Dow should have a bit of problem getting over it, and therefore, that's my stop. And my stop, I'm only risking like 20 bucks. Oh, right, 301. 69.5. So as long as he stays under 70 and he stays under um, 70. Oh, as long as they both stay under 70. That's easy to remember. Then I'm going to stick with this trade. You want to get confirmation from the other indexes that things are either going your way or not going your, your way. So right now, I'm looking for these guys to be under 70. And if they go over 70, I stop out. And if he goes over 300, I'm going to have my finger on the trigger. I'm over 24.3. I'm going to have my finger on the trigger to stop out too. But as long as these guys are under 70, it means that they're hitting the same resistance. And hopefully, we get a better pullback than the one we got so far. Oh, there we go. Nice. 40 bucks. Oh, 30 bucks. 15 bucks. Oh, it didn't last long. <laughs> 69, 69. Oh. 
So yeah, I had 60 bucks and I blew it. And by the way, if you don't like the way things are looking, now see now he's green and he's green. That's not good. So it's not looking good here. $35 loss. 70, that's where I said I wanted to, uh, he got rejected at 70. That's hopeful, but not great. I'm not liking the way this is going, so I'm probably going to give up 69, 69. If I get out even, I'll be happy. I'm going down 10 bucks, 10 bucks. Oh, wait, 69 again. Oh, he failed 69. Kicks me in the game. You see, I have my finger ready to go to get out, and I, I it wouldn't take anything for me to have gotten out, but I, but now he went down. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. Somebody failed their levels. He's now at 67. This is going to be exciting now. And he's back at 69. So, nope, it's not working. All right, I'm going to take a $5 profit, a $10 profit. Done. I just don't like the way it's working. It's not going, it's not really going smoothly. So I'm not that interested. It doesn't make any, I'm not going to worry about it. And you got to learn to do that. You got to take quick profits, quick losses. Okay. Even so, it's like, how long did that take? 20 minutes? We made 170 bucks. So, you know, it's like you got to take those quick profits. And if you don't have a setup, if it's not doing what you think it's going to do, get out. You can make another trade five minutes later. You don't need to stick with these things. Uh, da, da, da. We're seeing a pop-up screen on the lower left. Can you remove, please? We're seeing a pop-up screen on the lower left. Can you remove it, please? I can't see the pop-up screen. So I can't remove it if I can't see it. I don't know what that would be. Hang on. Let me take a look and see if I can find something. No. No. And no. And is it this? I don't see any other kind of screen that would be up there. <laughs> yeah, Brendan doesn't see it. Maybe it's just you. <laughs> oh, gone now. Okay. All right, whatever. I don't know what that was. Um, what month silver? I just did the front month, which is probably, um, the, you know, uh, well, I should say. June. It says June. So they're the June futures. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's a yes. <laughs> just because it's in the same spot doesn't mean it's the same contract. Oh, now the Russell took a nice dip, though. What the hell? Oh, I didn't put the slash. July. They are July futures. And what was here? Yes. See, now we got 68 again. We got 65 now. So... You know, again, you could go back in. If the, now, if he breaks 60, then this whole thing's going to get much more exciting. So it's probably 63, 67. Ah, I could have stuck with it. Oh, well. If he goes below 60, I'm inclined to hit the Dow again. Eighty-six. How much risk is that? Hmm. I don't want to risk that. Oh, 66. Going down hard now. Oh, I should have stuck it out. Look at that. That was very bouncy by comparison. Got 61 on the uh, NASDAQ and 67 on the S&P. 60.2. Really falling apart now on the Russell. Hmm. It's just too close to the closing. I'm not too confident right now. Once you get into that last half hour, that's when we can really jam it up on you. Oh, see, we're back in 90. 
Nah. Nah, I'm not feeling it. It's the bottom line. I just I, I don't have a strong feeling about it, so I don't think it's worth doing. Sorry, I only made 170 bucks. We'll try to do better next week. <laughs> All right, we meant to wrap this thing up. I gotta get back to work. Um, what else is going on? Oh, we we reviewed um let's let's do that real quick. That's important. We took a look in, in chat at the um Always good to, to go back to the, the uh, reviews. Um, we did the watch list update. And I did this once in a while, but usually, you know, I mean, I'll update the text once in a while. But mostly, what are we looking at? We're looking at stocks that we like. These are basically just a bunch of stocks that we would like to buy if they get cheap. So Apple getting cheap. Uh, Barrett Gold coming back up nicely. Still very cheap, though. Alaska Airlines, ridiculously cheap. Um, Bed Bath and Beyond, stupidly cheap. Blackstone, cheap. Also, they're gonna they're gonna probably bottom again and come back. Cheesecake Factory, that got away from us. Chicago Bridge and Iron, they're doing a weird merger, but I like them down here. Um, Quarterly Mines, they they got they they jumped up already. Uh, Chesapeake, still hovering three bucks, man. Uh, Long term natural gas play, and, and and with natural gas popping up this week, I don't understand why they're still so low. Um, Chimera Investments, we love them. They're a REIT. They pay a huge dividend. Uh, Cleveland Cliffs, also still very undervalued. Uh, ETE uh, Energy Transfer, is, uh, they're good. Uh, I mean, it would have been nice to see them down here, but it's only $1.50. It's not that big of a deal. Um, we were looking at selling the $15 puts for $2.60. I'm sure you can still do that. And uh, that was the only play we wanted on that one. Ford, we love. We have in, both, in our portfolios. They pay a nice dividend. Uh, FNSR, stupidly, stupidly cheap. Uh, really stupidly cheap. Highly recommend. FTR, they're having earnings next week. We'll find out if they're cheap or not. I think blast off time, but we'll see. We'll see what earnings are. We already have heavy position. Look at 5,000. We have 5,000 in the long term portfolio. Or uh, for the OOP, wait. No, we did. Okay. I'm sorry. We did 2,500 shares here, but I said it was a new trade. Wow. Okay. So, yeah, anyway, we've lost trade ideas for that. Um, GCI, they're also, they're, they're not bad. And they, yeah, they, play, they pay good dividend, too, but they're, good, they're a good hold for this price. GE, ridiculously, stupidly low at 1440. Just really banging the table on that one. Gilead, back to being cheap. Good price there. GNC, big long-term turnaround. I like them down here. GoPro, hmm. This is tricky. They have earnings. I guess we have them in the portfolio. Um, we sold puts. We sold them in the OOP. We, what do we sell? We sold the $8 puts for 4 bucks. So our break-even is right about, well, 375 So our break-even is 425 So we were just, you know, it was a... We took a chance back in uh, January when they when they sold off down here and they hit six, and we said, "Well, let's call a floor at four twenty-five." So we'll see what happens. I think they'll hold it though. H and R Block, as as we expected, they take off during tax season when everybody suddenly goes, "Hey, doesn't H and R Block do a lot of taxes and make money?" IMAX is about to have their uh, a record weekend. I don't understand why people aren't buying it at this point. Uh, it's already come up nicely from where we had it, but the Avengers thing is going to set new records for uh, ticket sales. Um, LB, we just talked about, stupidly cheap down here. Macy's got away. Uh, NLY, oh, another one, incredibly good read. Uh, PSA, Pearson, I like these guys. They're a good, steady company. They were priced way too cheap, but they kind of got away now. Um, SKT Tangiers, we just talked about. Love them down here. Sun Power got away. Uh, Target got away. THC got away. You know, unfortunately, we're, WPM got away. Uh, you know, I'm sorry, they can't all stay down. <laughs> and Whirlpool is still stupidly cheap. So there's still, anyway, there's still like, what, 15 something things that we could buy that are still incredibly good prices. So there's no shortage of things to buy. And that's why you shouldn't feel pressure to jump into things. And, and earnings season, I'll probably be adding more to the list uh, as earnings season progresses because there's uh, things go on sale for the dumbest reasons. 
So we will see what happens, okay? We'll follow up on this some more. But there's so just using that list, there's like dozens of stocks that you can buy. Uh, that's just our watch list. And that's not even including like today I sent out a top trade alert. Where was that? What was our top trade alert today? I forgot already. I know I sent out a top trade alert, but I have no idea what it was on. Um, top trades. Gilead. Oh, it was Gilead. And uh, on Gilead, we, all we did was sell five of the 2020 70 puts for 850. But that's, you know, we collected $4,250 just for promising to buy Gilead at 70 minus 850 for 6150. This is a $75 stock. We promised to buy it for net 6150, and we got paid $4,000 to, to promise to buy Gilead for a 20% discount. They are just giving you money in the market. All you have to do is learn how to take it. They are handing out cash to rich people. If you have the money to buy Gilead, then they're going to pay you for free to do nothing. It is so absolutely fantastic to be rich. <laughs> Cannot recommend it enough. Everybody needs to try it. What's your target for silver? I don't do targets. Um, I just think it's underpriced. Um, certainly at 1750, I would take money off the table on silver. Um, but I think we could see twenties again down the road. I think, um, you know, wages are rising. People are going on strike now. You, you know, wage inflation is a very, very long, slow grind. Wage inflation is what causes real inflation in the economy. Real inflation in the economy drives up metal prices. Um, not speculative metal. I'm talking about actual demand for metal. And silver is more of a demand metal. It's not like gold, which is a speculative metal. Um, although there's, there's obviously an underlying demand for gold as far as um, jewelry especially, but more so it's a speculative metal, whereas silver is really very much based on how much people are actually using silver. Um, so when as, things, as the economy expands and things industrialize, silver gets used a bit more. So... Long term, wages are rising. That money flows into the economy, especially when you pay the poor people, when you pay the bottom 80 poor people. The bottom 80%, unfortunately, are the poor people. And when you pay the poor people money, they use it pretty much right away because they don't have any savings. They're not buying stocks. They're taking their money to live. I mean, you give them more money, they, they live a little bit more. But they don't, uh, they don't put it away and invest it very much. So that money has a better multiplier when it flows down through wages and has more of an effect on the economy than uh, money that goes to the top 1%, which basically just goes right into a bank and dies. You know, the movement of money ceases when it goes to people in the top, at the top of the pyramid. Um, other than, of course, the bank turning around and lending it out, but that's just part of their normal transactions. So, and also lending, is, lending activity isn't that great either. So the bottom line is, Oh, PSA is public storage. I was thinking of Pearson. Uh, <laughs> okay, well, I like both of them. I do like Pearson, but yeah, you're right. Public, uh, what? Not now. Anyway, okay, so public storage I like too. They're just as good as Pearson. Um, but no dividend. I don't, I think, or, or a small dividend. Pearson pays a good dividend. Where were we? So silver. Oh, yeah, right. So anyway, so it's a long-term thing, though, because what has to happen for wages to go up is, First of all, minimum wages rose. Now, the people, when minimum rate wages rise, uh, see the problem with the, you probably with a lot of a lot of people here, you know, is that uh, some of you like, you know, for some of you are doctors and lawyers and things like that, and and you don't really get into the whole office thing. Like I, I built a lot of companies from scratch, and when you do that, you realize like how office gossip works and how people talk about salaries. So. When you've got hundreds of people in a company, you know, your, your secretaries and the people below you, they interact with all like the, the regular people in the company who are, um, you know, doing, doing regular jobs, including the warehouse people and things like that, and the truck drivers and so on and so forth. So when minimum wages go up, people get raises and people know people get raises because people talk about that they got a raise and they can do this and that. And they tell, so, so the, the janitor, says, oh, I got a great raise, and now I'm going to be able to do this, and we're going to go on vacation. Now, the secretary who's talking to the janitor in the hallway says, what? I haven't had a raise in 10 years. 
this is what happens. It's a, but it's a really slow process. So like we just saw like one group of teachers went on strike in one state. Now another couple of states of teachers are going on strike. It takes forever for these things to actually have a rolling effect. But the accumulating effect over the course of a decade is a massive, massive walk, rise in money and wages. It goes to the bottom 80% of the economy. The money comes away from the top 1%. Uh, but it, it's very, very beneficial to the economy because that money gets put to work in the economy and, and forces things up. So, I, I, again, I'm not going to say any soon time or anything like that, but over the course of time moving forward, we should see some really good inflation numbers, and that should really bring gold, silver, and, and other things up. So, you know, I, I like it for a long-term place. It's the kind of thing where I want to – I try to be in it. I don't know when it's going to go up. I just want to be there when it happens. So whenever I have a chance to buy low, I buy low, and then I'll sit on it as long as it takes. All right, good place to end it. Hope everybody was happy, and we will uh, pick it up again next week on our regularly scheduled time, Wednesday. All right, thanks, everybody.